I am Steven Edholm from skillcult.com and today I'm sitting on top of a charcoal trench that I burned about two years ago, I think. Now this experiment was for a couple different things. I was just trying to kind of get my feet wet and start to think about the idea of soil improvement and how to use these trenches for burning charcoal and improving the soil at the same time. So I just thought, well, okay, if you're going to dig a trench to make this great, you know, charcoal burning system, because I really like the trench, it's a great way to make charcoal, and then you already have the trench, well, you could just bury the charcoal in the trench and move on. So let's say you had a, a woodlot or a coppice woodlot or some kind of orchard or something like that. You could dig a trench and every year you'd burn all the prunings from the orchard in that trench and then just bury it back with dirt and you'd have the charcoal buried and you could move on and just slowly kind of improve your soil over the years. The other idea is that you need water to put out the fire and I thought well you know what if you just mixed it with wet dirt and so I did that and sure enough it went out as expected. So now I'm moving on to another experiment. I keep walking around the woods out here and you have to realize the context here. I'm on 40 acres, about probably close to 20 acres of it is wooded, and it was logged about 60 years ago, and it, they just made a big mess and then just left it, which is just standard logging practice, at least out here it is. So as the forest has grown back, it's just, it grows back as a total chaos. So there's way too many trees, they're very crowded, a lot of them they are sick, they're dying, they're dead. They're just small, they're crooked, they're unhealthy for some reason, and just generally the forest is very unhealthy. So if I went out, you know, say I came to this land and it hadn't been, I hadn't done anything to it yet, I could probably go and immediately cut down about 70% of the trees and it would be an improvement. Like I would improve the health of the forest, the wildlife habitat, you know, just generally from most perspectives, you'd have to see it as a good thing. Of course, when I say trees, I mean everything from, you know, little saplings up to big trees. So I've steadily been working on that. The area you see behind me um, is largely thinned and limbed up, but it used to be just a thick tangle of small fir trees and saplings and stuff like that. But that's a continuing process. This area right here needs a lot more clearing. Where I'm looking at up this way, I've done some, but there's a lot more to do. There's stuff out this way. There's dead wood lying around. And I keep going out and seeing the stuff and I think, well, you know, I could haul that back and make charcoal with it to make biochar, but that's a lot of work. How can I burn on site? And I always come up with the same problem. I have simple methods. They require only like a shovel and some matches basically, but I always have to put the fire out with water. I dig a trench, do the burn, get it full of charcoal, but then the charcoal's burning. So how do I put it out? Okay, so my idea is to haul in like a 10 foot by four foot sheet of uh, sheet metal, roll that out over the trench once it's full, cover the edges completely with dirt and then just let it go out. So basically I'd be excluding the oxygen and putting it out. Now that sheet metal I'm talking about is really just thin lightweight stuff. It's not a big deal to roll it up in a you know 12 inch or smaller diameter tube and just carry it out into the woods. So here's the plan. This week, uh, my friends Erica and Jessica are coming over and we're going to do a burn. Now, Erica's land is 200 acres and she has the same problem I do. I was describing this experiment to her and she's like, yeah, that's exactly my problem. You know, she has tons and tons of overgrowth and areas that need to be thinned. She's been battling, you know, these invasive fir trees that just grow in, in thick clumps and trying to thin those out and has like huge amounts of brush for burn piles. And, you know, charcoal can be sold too. So she could either use the charcoal on her land or actually uh, turn it into a product that she can sell to help, you know, get by. So she wanted some experience burning charcoal. So they're gonna come over and we're gonna do an experiment with this system. And it's just gonna be basically the three of us digging a trench, burning, doing some clearing while we're at it because my other idea is like if you can get, um, you know, even I can do a little bit of clearing by myself while burning, but it takes quite a bit of attention. It almost takes a person, one person just to do manage the burn and, and kind of pull brush from close by. So with the three of us, we can actually do some forestry work. I mean, we can do some limbing, get some work done. And I'm thinking, okay, what if two to three people go into an area like this, like how long would it take us to burn, say a hundred gallons of charcoal this way and get a bunch of forestry work done at the same time. So that's what we're doing. 
I'm going to walk around right now and just show you the area a little bit that we're working with and some of the stuff that I'll be cutting and, and why, because I don't really talk about that stuff very much, but it's really an important and integral part of this whole process to me, like how I think about it, the conservation aspect, like the fact that I'm trying to improve the habitat, you know, the fact that I understand this ecology. I mean, I've spent a lot of time studying this. I know what, you know, what the trees are, like their different habits, and whether they grow back when you cut them or whether they die when you cut them. And all this stuff is really important. So when I talk about projects like this, or things like the Cordwood Challenge Project, you know, I'm kind of assuming a lot. And it's just so integrated into my thinking that I, I just, I think, I think that I'm just uh, subconsciously assuming it's a foregone conclusion that, you know, you don't do this kind of stuff unless you have an understanding of what your goals are and what the hell's going on out here. So I'm gonna talk about this a lot more in the future, you know, at some point, there's just so many videos to make and projects to do that it's hard for me to get to everything but I do want to talk about that and also just let me plant a seed which is that I'd like you to start thinking if you don't already think think of forest that you walk through whether it's your land or just a place you're visiting as a timeline start to see it as a timeline this is one of the most valuable things I could tell you about learning your ecology because it is a timeline and when I look at it, I see a history. I see a, his, a past history and where also the forest is headed from here. And you really can only do that by, you know, long observation. But I just want to plant that seed for you to start thinking of it in those terms. And you can really learn a lot about a forest and where it's been and where it's headed and how you can um, help it into a direction that might achieve certain goals. Okay, so let's take a look at the area that we're working with here. There's this nice meadow over here with uh, some big trees and a bunch of brush. Now down here, this is kind of above my main living area. There's a fir and hardwood forested area. I've done a lot of clearing in here already. You can see that a lot of the trees are limbed up, although they're not limbed as high as I want them for the most part. And I've already taken out lots and lots of small crowded trees. Now this is still too crowded and I'll be taking out a lot more, but the stuff that's remaining, most of it, I want to use for building materials like uh, poles for rafters and stuff like that, or I want to leave the trees for the long run to get larger for just to be trees up here or to cut for and mill for lumber eventually, or for someone else to cut and mill for lumber eventually. So this area I'm kind of managing as both a wood lot for lumber and building material, but also to uh, increase the health of the hardwoods that are here because the firs are really trying to take over. They start growing in big thickets and then they grow up th you know, through the shade and they pierce the canopies of the hardwoods and then they begin to take over and shade the hardwoods out. So the hardwoods are much less healthy than they would be if they didn't have so much competition from the firs. And that's important because the hardwoods are what make really good wildlife habitat for the most part. These here are going to be madrones, black oaks, and tan oaks. So the oaks make acorns for wildlife to eat, and the madrone makes berries, which birds really like to eat. So way down there in the sun where this forest gives way to meadow, the madrone trees that can like reach out into the light, and they kind of like lean out into the meadow, those have way more berries and way, you know, they're just, they have way more resources to make fruit than the trees that are up here in the more crowded wooded area. So by reducing the competition and thinning some of this forest, we can, you know, really increase the wildlife habitat. And I can tell you, for instance, this year, the uh, doves are sticking around for an extra month or so eating the berries. So they're on their way to Mexico and they stop as they pass through, they'll stop for a while and just pig out on madrone berries. So, you know, these are the kind of management goals I have. Now up in here, again, I've done a lot of work, but I want to do more limbing. Look at all the limbs on that. So I can turn all those limbs into charcoal. And same here, you know, I've limbed up to a certain height, but I want to limb quite a bit higher. So we'll be doing a lot of that kind of limbing work uh, as we burn and just get this area really, you know, cleaned up and improved. Here's a nice live oak tree and it's slowly starting to get shaded out. So it did pretty good for itself. You know, it got established here and that's good, but then the fir trees start to move in. So over here, you can see all these fir trees. They shoot up and they can really compete. You know, they can get through the shade, pierce the canopy like these are here. And pretty soon these, 
fir trees are going to start growing limbs way out over the top of this oak tree. The oak tree will become shaded out and it'll just become less and less healthy. And you can see up here, look at all those little fir trees growing. There's just a big thicket of them there and they're just going to take over and eventually these oaks may actually just die. But it doesn't really matter so much because they're not going to be productive. So in terms of wildlife habitat, you know, feeding wildlife and all that, they're just not, not happening. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking at when I'm looking at all these trees and what to do in this area. So you can see in here on the ground, there's all kinds of limbs and that's just from limbing up these small fir trees because before I got started, they had limbs all the way down to the ground, which of course is also a fire hazard. So, you know, fi fires aren't necessarily a bad thing. They have their benefits. But if you get a fire in an area like this where all these trees have dead limbs all the way down to the ground, well, you get a really hot fire and then it kills most of the trees and that's counterproductive. So now if we get a fire through here, it'll be a cool burning ground fire and not this like raging inferno. And so it'll kill off some of the trees, thinning them out, and it will remove a lot of the dead wood and clear up the forest and it actually could improve the health of the forest in the long run. I like to leave some of this small stuff, but anything that's about an inch and over I'll probably turn into charcoal. The rest of this stuff, as long as it's laying flat, it'll eventually, you know, start to get covered with uh, leaves and pine needles and stuff and rot down and just disappear. And it's valuable as uh, forest food, right? I mean, this is soil food. These trees spend a lifetime gathering resources. I mean, they're accumulating the things that trees are made of. So if we leave some of this stuff in the forest to rot down, it's just going to basically be available to grow more trees. So I definitely don't, you know, I'm not making an effort to just clean up and remove and take everything away. And typically for me, that means leaving mostly the small stuff, especially since I have a great interest in making charcoal. So context, 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 context. All right, let's head up the hill. So way up here, you can see this fir thicket that I haven't touched yet. And look at just how many little tiny trees are in there. The more of those I thin out to an extent, the healthier the ones that remain will be. And again, with all those low branches, if a fire comes through here, it's going to be a real mess. But if I can get them limbed up at least six feet high, that'll really help a lot. And I live in fire country. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I also have large trees that need to be dealt with. This tree is a tan oak. Um, it won't be alive for more than two more years, probably not even that, because it is infected with Phytophthora remorum, also known as sudden oak death syndrome. And it's going to get cut this, uh, this next spring or summer. Now I'm waiting until spring or summer to cut this because I want to peel the bark to use for tanning leather. So in the meantime, since I know it's going to get cut anyway because it's badly infected, I can take all of these uh, limbs off that are small enough to make charcoal and pull those down the hill as well. Sadly, there is another rather large, beautiful tan oak right here that is also infected. This tree is probably still 12 inches in diameter at 20 or 25 feet. It's a rather large tree. It's going to have a bunch of beautiful bark right there. So I also want to peel that in the spring. Same thing. In the meantime, I can take off all these hanging low limbs. Same thing with these other hardwoods down the hill here. There's a madrone. There's another oak way down in there. All these low tangly branches that are going to burn like crazy in a fire, they can all come off. So we'll be also pulling and cutting some of that stuff for this burn if uh, we run out of material down there. And it just goes on and on and on. Look up in there. You know, the whole forest here is like this. It needs a lot of work. It's just a huge job just to try to keep up with it, um, let alone making use of all the different materials. But one of the main ones for me at this point is producing as much charcoal as possible. I'm producing it not only for my own benefit and the use in my soil for like my garden and stuff, but for doing larger scale experiments that uh, maybe can, you know, help other people and for yield information that can help other people with uh, their projects and improving their land. It's a huge job just to try to keep up with this and there's no way I can cut as many tan oaks as I should be cutting. 
This one looks infected too. You know, I have to, I'm looking at cutting all of these down, peeling the bark and storing that, limbing them up, you know, burning the brush for charcoal and either just leaving the wood or figuring out something to do with it. Just that alone is an enormous job to try to keep up with here. <clears throat> So I'm trying to make that as simple as possible. The less I have to move the brush for long distances, especially if I can't get to it with a vehicle, which is, you know, a lot of my property is steep with no roads, then if I can come up with a system to deal with that, um, that would just be really great. And I think this, I think this system is going to work great. I think it's going to be great for me. I think it's going to be great for Erica and her property. Look at the size of this fir tree. That limb right there is about 16 inches in diameter. That's a monster. See, the loggers didn't cut this because it was too limmy, like it had limbs growing way down to the ground. It's also a gold mine of pitch. Look at all of this in here is just big gobs of pine or of, uh, fir resin. 